It's like the best salad in the world. Hi, my name is Ernest Cervantes, uh, the chef owner of the Burnt Bean Company in Seguin, Texas. Growing up in Uvalde, Texas, I was really blessed with a family on both sides of my family that were phenomenal cooks. You know, my grandma had a, a, a tamale business and, and uh, you know, my dad was barbecuing all the time, as well as, you know, my grandfather, which is my mom's dad, you know, would always, I would remember going to his, he had actually had an outside kitchen and he would barbecue there or, you know, he would, uh, you know, make salsas and things like that. So. Growing up, we were very spoiled because everybody cooked in our family. So, you know, if it wasn't one side of the family that we ate at, it was the other side of the family that ate good. So we always had good food growing up. So it was a shock when I left home and came to the big city and, and, and the food wasn't the same. But, uh, you know, I had so many great inspirational people that I grew up with to help me cook the way I am today. The way I, I ended up in the, in the cooking industry is that, you know, going to college as well as, you know, anybody else that goes to college, you need to have a job. And I always thought, you know, I love to eat. And uh, I knew that I couldn't afford working and then paying for, for meals. So needing somewhere to eat, um, I realized that that was a win-win situation. And not necessarily do I work, but then I get free food at the same time just to survive. It was survival mode. It wasn't one of those, oh, I get to eat out all the time. It was no, it was, I had nothing in my refrigerators. I was broke as a joke. And uh, that was the only way we to survive. But as I was working in the restaurant industry, I realized something that I sucked at, at school. I, I really didn't have that passion, but at the same time, I realized that I found what I was calling it, it was restaurant. I was really good at it. I was really, I, I'm talking, I, I hit the floor running and I understood food. And I don't think it had anything to do with my growing up because all the shit that I had made growing up had nothing to do with what I was doing now, but I fell in love with the food. And if I felt like I was inspired, like I used to get excited to go to work and I used to work so many hours. And, and you know, I was one of those guys that if you didn't want your shift, I'd pick it up. And you know, no one does that nowadays. And I, and I realized that the, the, better, the better and better I cooked, the more and more incentives there was. I became a corporate trainer, I got paid more. And I, re, I, I realized that I became a leader and, and to run kitchens at the age of 21. 20 years later, I got myself a barbecue joint and I'm an owner and a chef of, of, of my dream. And, and, and it tells you that it took me 20 years to get where I'm at, you know, and, and none of it, none of it was taken for granted. You know, I had to work my ass off to get where I was at. I had a dream and I had a purpose and I, I, and I didn't have money. That's the biggest deal. You know, a lot of these guys, you know, they got a guy they know or another guy they know and they get these restaurants and they don't give a shit about them because they didn't have to work for it. You first gotta have money, you first you gotta have a reputation and, and second you gotta have the chops. I didn't have any of that. So, uh, you know, I thought of the best way to get to where I wanted to be and plan, you know, at the top of the mountain was the restaurant. I was down here and how was I gonna get up there? And the, the, the most financially uh, realistic way was doing competitions, you know, barbecue competitions. There was, uh, I, I always tell these people, when I started competition world, there was no classes. There was no, you know, it was even before MySpace. Okay, there was just blogs and, and there was these uh, group chats and, and certain internet places that would talk about competition, but they wouldn't tell you anything. And that's where I started. I started off with the HB Barrel Pit and a knockoff Weber that I've had that I got at a rum and cell. And, uh, and that's it. And I had my best friends, which was Santos and Anthony. And, uh, you know, and the only reason we did it is because my neighbor, Dale, he was like, dude, you got to do these competitions. I'm like, you know. Let's try it. And uh, he signed up for it and everything. And uh, right off the bat, 60 teams, we got first place. So we were hooked. And, uh, but as time went on, I got more obsessed. And I got more obsessed that, you know, they always say, uh, make your obsession your passion. And that's what happened to me. I was so obsessed to becoming, you know, the best rib cooker, because that, that's what I was in charge of on my team. And then I, uh, you know, a slowly progression, my team just started dwindling because they weren't into it as much as I was. I didn't want to go out there and drink beer. I didn't want to go out there and just be okay. I wanted to win every weekend. I wanted to be the grand champion. I wanted the ones that everybody feared with, you know, when I got there. And that's what happened. You know, I started taking over ribs and chicken and brisket, and that was all on my own. The Burnt Bean Company was Ernest Cervantes. 
and that, but at the end of the day, it ended up just becoming uh, me, my wife, and my daughter, and my son. It was, it went from a party scenery, best friends to family. And, and when we became a family team, that's when we started becoming successful because your team was focused as much as you were. Uh, you know, you wanted to uh, win as well as, you know, you put a lot of things on the line. I, I remember sometimes I wanted to go do a cook off and we didn't have financial means to do it. You know, it's like, do we pay the light bill? Do we pay the water bill or do we do a cook off? We'd go to these cook offs and you have these huge rig, these rigs that were elaborate, or you had these awesome, like, you know, trailer RVs and, and buses with all these people living in, you know, air conditioned on, on, on an August Texas heat. And what did I have? I had a sponsor generator DeWalt 5,000 watt that weighed like 4,000 pounds just to push a fan. And, and we slept in the back of the truck and tents. I remember sleeping in tents. And, uh, you know, we, we used to pull out the mat, we were so poor. We used to pull out the mattress from the, the couch and we roll it up with bungee cords and throw it in the back of the truck. Whatever we could put in the back of my Dodge truck is what we did. And we survived. So we, you know, we, you know, you never tell your kids how poor you are. You always make it fun. So we always told our little girl that we were camping. So she thought it was fun to leave, sleep outside in the back of a truck. And when it got hot, we put her inside. She was two and three and put her in the air conditioner, you know. Um, just thinking about it, it just, it just brings in the heartstrings. But, you know, we were, we were broke, but we had a dream and a vision. And I was not going to let it up. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, we slowly got better. And I started getting stronger. And I practiced and I practiced. And we started getting sponsorships. You know, who, who, who even knew about sponsorship back in the day? And I remember this guy's like, man, you did good here, man. Try a bottle of my sauce. And I'm like, oh, thanks. And there was a big guy, uh, Bubba over here, he, uh, Bubba Ranky. And he was a good guy and he gave me his rubs. And I was like, oh, I'm getting sponsored. You know, I got, I got, you know, got rubs and, and, you know, you might not think of it as much, but that was, you know, 20, 30 bucks you didn't have to spend at cook-offs that, that went back in your pocket. But I realized the better I got, I got more doors opened and we slowly got better and better. And then we started, you know, our goal was to be the best in New Braunfels and be the best around the county and then just keep on spreading. Once we started saving money and, and, and once we started winning, we, we realized that we get more money in our pockets and that's when we went into our first investment pit. And then we got our first trade, it was a 30 by 60 uh, pits and spits. Uh, George Shore and uh, Victor and all those guys that are now pit maker, they were running the show over there and, and I was really excited. I remember, my mom told me, if you come up with the first uh, 2,000 bucks, I think, I don't know how much that thing cost me. Because if you come up with the first 2,000, your grandma will give you 1,000 and I'll give you 1,000. So I saved it up, you know, uh, we're, God, I remember, I was like, oh, I was so scared because it was all our money we had. And, uh, and we bought it. My parents, you know, backed me up and so did my grandparents because everybody believed in me. And uh, that's when it really took off because now we had a consistent trailer that could produce a consistent product. And, uh, we got more and more successful. And then I started going in grand champions. You know, that was the cool part. You know, I always got, you know, first in ribs or a first in brisket, but never everything was all together. And that's when we started really working as a team and, and understanding the, the whole concept of one trailer, one all product and producing the same quality of meats. Uh, and that's where we became successful and we figured it out. Well, I figured it out. That's what I think has really the reason why I'm successful, not only in the competition world, but in the restaurant world too, because I understand the whole equation of understanding a piece of meat, a piece of rib, any kind of protein is always different, but if you understand the basics of the science of that meat, you can conquer it all during, because people think, oh, you slap it on there, it's gonna be cooked, and then that's it. No, you gotta factor in the humidity, you gotta factor in if it's raining outside, how hot, how windy, all that stuff takes into place and what kind of brisket you're using or what kind of rib. And, and that's the difference between me and a lot of people is, is that I figured that shit out, you know? Um, and I'm proud to say that, you know, I worked, I worked my way up and I understood every single thing. You know, it's like I went to a, you know, a, a maze and went through every, you know, every part of the maze to understand it. And that's what makes me different than anybody else. I, I you know, even though I'm just in my early forties and, and I was most successful in my early thirties in barbecue competition world, compared to if you see all the competition worlds, all the old school guys were all the old guys. I was one of the young guys. I was in my thirties. I was like 30, 28, 29, 30 years old. And I was winning and I was beating those guys. And that you didn't see that and much less a Mexicano out there. And, and as, as I got 
stronger and stronger, I got more of a reputation. And that reputation led me to what opened Pandora's box was the Food Network, Texas Pitmasters. They were, they were looking for uh, chefs, but yet Pitmasters. And uh, they're like, Ernie, you're like the only dude that fits this profile. And, you know, I applied for it and I said, screw it. And uh, lo and behold, you know, I got on the show and, and I was in the car with three other dudes and a lady. And we we're driving to the set. And they said, I was in the back, you know, we we're in the, in the van or whatever. And I'll always remember, and they all knew each other and they, no one knew who the fuck I was. And that's when my life changed when that guy goes, okay, it's gonna be between me or you, or me or you. And they're like, what about that guy in the back? What, the big Mexican? No one knows who the fuck he is. He's probably gonna go out the first round. And that is when my life changed. I said, I'm about to make all y'all my bitches. And it was the best feeling in the world when they were just, when I whooped their ass on the first round. And then everybody comes back and they're in the group and they're like, so who won? They're like, that dude. And everybody's like, who the fuck's that dude? And I said, yeah. So I knew right then and there in that van that I was like, no more Mr. Nice Guy. I'm gonna show you who I am. And not only was I representing myself, but to be the inspiration to Mexicanos. And not only that, that's not where it's about. It's to be the inspiration to all the small town folk that never thought they can get out of their small hometown. You won't believe how many hundreds of emails and letters from high school kids and college kids from small town USA, Mexicanos a lot, saying, you know, I always thought that I would have to work at the local factory or the local, you know, city. But when I saw you and I know where you're from and you went all the way up there and you beat them, you inspired me to work, follow my dreams. And that's what I've always been about. I always said, if I ever became something great, I would pay it forward. I would inspire the future Mexicanos. I would inspire the future Americans to dream big and work hard because I am living testament of what hard work looks like. I am living testament of you don't say no and never take no for an answer. The burnt bean since day one was different. Uh, we're not the normal people. We've never been normal. I've always been weird too. It's more of that, that, that have that attitude when I come to the barbecue restaurant world is that I want to prove there's so many great barbecue fucking joints. There is. I'm going to keep it real. There's a lot of guys that are better than me, but I still want to be different. And that's what makes us different. You know, we're going to try to produce the best quality barbecue there is in Texas, but the same side, you know, I got 500 cards up my sleeve. You know, I can hit you with my culinary background. I can hit you with all kinds of cuisine, you know, and that's what makes us different that not only are we showing the, the, the normal stuff, we're throwing some crazy shit at you on left field. And that's what's gonna make us set us apart from everybody else. I don't wanna be classified. I hate it when they try to classify me as, as Tex-Mex or Mexican-American influence. Yeah, my motto is Viva Barbecue, but that's hooray barbecue, long live barbecue. And because that's my roots, but I'm not telling you that's what I'm gonna be cooking. You know, I have my Sunday specials and the only reason I have it, and then you might say, well, that's kind of hypocritical, Ernest, because you're not Tex-Mex, but on Sundays you're serving menudo barbacoa and, and you know, mollejas and tripas. I said, yeah, but that's not because I'm Tex-Mex. That's an homage like I told you about my family. Every Friday, every Sunday growing up was what? Back in the day, now it's, it's convenient. Was what? Menudo. I remember memories like that. I remember my dad's barbacoa. I remember my, my dad's mollejas and tripas. That is my thank you and my, you know, dedication to my family roots. Super Dave, Dave Kirkland, uh, my, my white brother from another mother, man. Um, you know, the other day, uh, Dave and I were talking and we were talking about all these memories and it's amazing that some of the biggest things of my life when it came to the barbecue world, he was right there next to me. You know, that was, you know, he's been there for so much and we've been best friends uh, for 10 years and you got two of the, <laughs> the most opposite people in the world. And that's what makes us so unique. Uh, and that's why we click so good is that, that motherfucker, I taught him and he comes and beats me with my own shit. That's never happened before, man. And, and, I, and, I, and, and I realized that I've given so many recipes out and I've told people how to do it. At the end of the day, they always change shit up and they never do good because I was comfortable because I know you're gonna change it. He's the only dude that ever, never changed it. He did everything I told and he fucking kicked my ass with my own shit. And I was like, this dude, man. And I thought from then on out, we clicked and we've been best friends for 10 plus years. And now he's, you know, he's, uh, you know, he, when I started this whole pop-up thing, 
um, with the with the burnt bean doing these pop-ups, uh, he wanted to do it. And then we started doing them and he wanted to be part of that dream because he saw something. I think he saw my, my passion and he wanted to be something, part of something special. And he's like, I'm gonna be here with you, man. And I said, all right. And he was been there and he's kept his word since till today and that's a year and a half later. And that's why he's super Dave. And I love the dude. You know, he, you know, not only, it's kind of funny because people, we have the same friends and no one linked us together. You know, no one be like, wait, 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 y'all are friends? I'm like, no, we're business partners. Like, wait, what? How did I not know that y'all hung out, you know? And that's the crazy part. And, and that's a real huge reason why he's my business partner. And he owns, you know, you know he's, he's one of the owners of the Burn Bean Company. You know, there's, at the end of the day, there's three of us, man. And, and I tell people that God, you know, God has a lot to do with my life and I'm looking at him while I should be looking at you. But I think God brings people together at a certain time because of a reason. I'm not into fate. I really don't believe in fate. I believe that you create your future. But no, I'm not bullshit. And the, the stars like aligned and brought me, Freddie, and Dave together. And we bring three, three things that no one else has. Us three bring something special to the table every single one. There's not two chefs and a dude. There's not a dude and a dude and a chef, or there's no chefs and all three dudes. The reason why us three work together good is because we're not stronger than the other person what they're good at. Freddie knows his shit when it comes to laws and, 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 and everything. Dave knows his shit when it comes to anything, okay? And I know my shit when it comes to food. And that's what, what makes the burnt beans look successful is that it's not the big picture. It's the small little things in that picture, the attention to detail, what makes us different than everybody else. You know, here at the Burnt Bean, we take pride in everything we do. And, uh, you know, the main thing is, is that you can't skimp out on what, what people are here for is the meats, proteins. You know, we, we actually have, we run through two different types of beef purveyors. We have a solid pork purveyor, uh, but you gotta have quality products. And, and that's what makes us different. Another thing too, is you use quality beef to make our sausage. You know, we make our sausage. We go through 120 pounds of sausage a week, you know, and that's a lot of links. And, uh, you know, that's what makes us different is that we're not just throwing any kind of brisket we can find on the, on the pits. They're, they're, they're locally sourced. Uh, they're aged for 30 to 45 days before we even bring them in. We buy our meat in bulk. We send them to the plants and they sit them there and we have a rotation. I mean, how many motherfuckers do this? Rotation, 30 to 45 days. They, we wet age them before we give them to our customers. It's not something that was slaughtered, oh, whenever, let's just throw it on the pit. No, we find out when it's slaughtered, when we buy it, and the days total 35 days, and we say, we're gonna sell that many this week, and they come through us. Every time they come in here, they're wet aged for 30 to 40 days. And where does that come from? That comes from my background of competition world, because I do the same thing. We wet age them. You tell me who else wet ages them. Maybe Aaron Franklin, I don't know. And maybe there might be a lot of people, but that's the stuff that the burnt bean does is that we go above and beyond and we wet age our stuff before we cook them. And that's what we do. And uh, it's the attention to detail again. Uh, we're, we're, we're simple when it comes to wood. It's post oak. That's all we use, aged post oak, nine, you know, 9% 9 moisture. Um, and that's all we use. And we use nothing but stick burners. And uh, our babies are mill scales. They're named after my grandma's. Uh, Melian Belia, uh, A and B pit, that's what we call them. Um, they're 1,000 gallon, 5,000 pound, bad bees. 21 foot uh, stacks, everybody freaks out when they see them. Yeah, those mill scales are, are, are the backbone of, of what the burnt bean's about. We're about to get two more. This, you know, the burnt bean will be one of the baddest motherfucking places to eat, I'll tell you that. And it's gonna have some bad barbecue and, and, and we're bringing stuff that people aren't used to at a regular barbecue joint. You know, at the end of the day, it smells like barbecue here, but it doesn't look like it's a barbecue joint. And that's what makes us different. Burnt bean's been different since day one and we still continue to be different. And that's what makes us unique and special. We're not a cookie cutter barbecue competition cook. We're not a cookie cutter uh, team and definitely now with the restaurant, I guarantee you we're not a cookie cutter restaurant.